So Raymond McDaniel um, is famous for his penetrating blue eyes and uh, <laughs> having the voice of a tyrant. He's a faculty member uh, in the Sweetland Writing Center, and his recent publication, uh, most recent publication, is Saltwater Empire, published in 2008. Um, his next book is forthcoming from Coffee House Press. Great. <laughs> These things change, so I just um, have to keep checking. Uh, I'll check on, on that again before you come up. Um, uh, it's a book inspired by uh, the Legion of Superheroes, which I'll let him tell you about if he wants to tell you about it. Um, it's quite a tale. So, Ray, instruct us. <laughs> Can you see them from here? I'm very fond of everyone who is reading today, including the redoubtable Aaron McCullough. In poetry world, this does not occur. You are simply not fond <laughs> of the other poets. Certainly, you're not going to be fond of four of them in a row. <clears throat> I only like to try to write books that I know are going to fail. That said, within that general ambition, I do like some variation. My uh, first book is called Murder. It's kind of bleak. <laughs> My second book uh, is also kind of bleak with glimmers of hope. I wanted to write something that I just thought would be fun, something entertaining. And so I uh, decided that I was going to fail by writing a book about the Legion of Superheroes. The Legion of Superheroes is published by DC Comics. It's been coming out once a month for more or less 50 years, uh, which makes it the longest serial narrative in the 20th century. Uh, the idea behind it is that a thousand years from now, a bunch of teenagers decide uh, to start a superhero club inspired by the heroes of our present, of the 20th and 21st century. Things happen. The core of, uh, of this commitment to this superhero club rests, uh, or the, the burden for creating it in some ways rests on a guy named Brainiac Five. Uh, Brainiac Five is a lime green, he wears a purple jumpsuit, his only superpower is how smart he is. I was obsessed with Brainiac Five when I was a little boy, also uh, yesterday. <clears throat> Brainiac 5 falls in love with Supergirl. Since Supergirl is a creature a thousand years in the past, you can see how this would create problems. It's quite the long distance relationship. He invents time travel machines in order to recruit Supergirl to the Legion of Superheroes. This poem is called What to Expect. Sibling rivalry persists. Girls have come to trust girls, but boys will still be boys. Dumb, stupidly sentimental. Dim, almost divine boys will race ahead, even after you ask them not to. Paragods with their girls in their arms go whoosh and zoom. We lose our minds more often than we might like. There will be hair pulling, but as a rule, we will stand on ceremony. We are shopping for our girlfriends when we are challenged to duels, to tests, to expressions of worthiness. Androids are a problem. They always will be. <laughs> Someone is always pulling off a mask and saying, surprise! Some still murder, just for the thrill of it. Telepathic, prets, telepathic pets turn out to be sentient. Adults resent us, owe us insist upon us. We still get sick. Rigel fever, VSR virus, pain plague, heartache, nostalgia. Lots of imposters, mirror images, inversions, and betrayals. We don't need more than the identities we already have. Sometimes we are tracking a fierce astro vulture. Sometimes a galactosaur. We are never bored. 
Somehow there is money without poverty, and somehow without poverty, people still want to steal. World War VI was fought in 2783 with super weapons wielded by computer minds, but all that is so, so long ago. We fall for games and fads in outrageous fashions. We get killed, of course, but we don't always die. Crystals, in their approximation of life, replace flowers, which are left to live and die without our interruption. Our adolescent vanity is entirely justifiable, for we will grow up, but we will never grow old. As the uh, narrative of the Legion of Superhero commences, its tone changes. It starts in the 1950s and uh, continues to the present. So you get these very weird uh, models uh, of a kind of archaic standards of social norms at the same time that it tries to represent what the future will be like. Um, this has schizophrenic consequences, particularly in terms of gender politics. This poem was called Superboy Does Not Love Duo Damsel. I've come to you just to see you do what I know you'll do, which is leave her even though it will look as if she is leaving you, and I know that, and so does Claude Rains and maybe Conrad Veet, but not everyone here tonight, mixed up crowd and a few crickets, and this girl's I'm with, two mono twins in the back seat of Pa's car. She's spooky, these two. Well, she wanted to see some gothic space movie, living intestines and dead intestines, but I wanted to see you, just like you wanted that same old song, even though it was no darn good. I've spent all day in the future pool. Chemical stink and age for skin less than steel. These girls finish each other's sentences. Gosh, I'd like a root beer? I'm ganged up and outnumbered when one of her slides from the inflatable dolphin and says she thinks I am keen. A weak solution of Halloween, payday, and rust. But for just a second, I think it's the other whose lips are moving. Anyways, I know every word to this movie except what the Nazis say and the boring bits in Paris, but yes to the airport scene and all the banter, and I'm asking you, how can you be so sure about what you don't want? This is called Nobody Loves Chameleon Boy. Who can't get a date? Who tells himself, people are too superficial? Who conveniently ignores the imperative to define superficial enough? Who knows that's funny coming from him, who is orange and bald, who is the first alien who looks, you know, alien, who wonders why anyone wouldn't want a shape changer, who thinks anyone superficial would think that was the greatest thing ever, who is too alien to know that your date wants to know who you really are, who will never learn that no one actually wants to know that, and who won't find out how ghastly even any given real you really is, who will have his most meaningful relationship with a blob of protoplasm, who is whomever, who is skin deep. It's true. He never, he never gets lucky. <clears throat> Brainiac 5 loves Supergirl. Brainiac 5 loves Supergirl. Supergirl loves Brainiac 5. Supergirl will love Brainiac 5 once she meets Brainiac 5. By the time Supergirl meets Brainiac 5, Supergirl will have been dead 1,000 years. Brainiac 5 wants Supergirl to get to know him, because Brainiac 5 will go back in time to meet Supergirl, who will be alive 1,000 years ago. Supergirl will also be alive a thousand years from then, due to the lunatic genius love of Brainiac 5. Brainiac 5 thought of everything. He could think of Supergirl. He could accept what he was going to say to Supergirl. See, even when I try to have fun, it gets sad. <laughs> I do my best. This is what to expect, future ecology. Cities sprawl, but artful, without happenstance. Because urban planning has infinite reach, 
They are beautiful, coral, colorful as oceans. Beautiful, but sterile. Still, no suburbs, only cityscapes, clean, neat. Zones once considered inhospitable revert to naked states. Deserts unfold without interruption. Seas surge fresh, unfinished. Jungles mutate to keenly shaded greens. Plains rustle irregular. Every acre of once wild will be primeval, floral, faunal. The globe, a garden. This is the sacrifice of kid psycho. (laughs) (laughs) The sacrifice of kid psycho, Superboy, number 125, December 1965. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Operal, does your baby have a giant head? Even for a baby? There's good news. He is likely a mutant with extraordinary mental powers. However, your world will be destroyed and you with it. Because the more extraordinary the offspring, the more likely your world is to die. But you will make sure your large-headed, large-hearted son will escape to safety in a rocket ship. He will do good. He will wear a turban. He will call himself Kid Psycho. Every time he does something awesome, he will slice a year off his life. Rest assured, this is the kind of boy the Legion keeps in reserve. Even though you brought him up right, all your boy will want to do is die. Don't feel bad. After all, what is life worth if you must sacrifice your youth to save it? The Doomed Legionnaire Adventure Comics, 353, February 1967. This is the most important thing that will ever happen to us. When the most important thing that will ever happen to you begins, you don't know, which isn't to say it starts as something small. In this case, we know immediately the threat, pink candy floss that eats suns. A clotted cotton cloud without a sky unless all of space counts as sky. The sun eater has no mind. There's nothing for us to trick or bludgeon or convince. So we do something we never do. We ask for help. But everyone is busy or selfish or despairing or else they can't read our plea even though sun boy etched it in flare visible for millions of miles. Pressed for time, we even cut a deal with the fatal five. Immunity for aid, we compromise, we plan, we fail. And finally, Pharaoh Lad just flies a bomb into the pink beast. Into diffuse, he soars. Into tentative tendrils and voracious, glittering candy dust. Pharaoh Lad incandesces and will never come back. All those lives we are always saving. Of course, death occurred to us. You could call it our anti-motivator. But only now do we know what it is to be destroyed. Thus, (laughs) Barrow Lad Memorial action figure. (laughs) Soldier Boy. Happy as a waltz with you in my palm, jarhead, miniature metal marine, heroic force since 2959, how do you come in your mutant shine to the utter, utter jungle of my backyard? Legionnaire, I flung you like a grenade, all heft and lantern jaw, all intent, flung you at mud which only yielded bubble, flung you at birds, scarlet roped from long, tricky scarves. Nothing could shake the mask from your shiny shell or empty your innards of iron, chrome cast all the way to skin. How happy I was with your ideals of sacrifice, your martyring, 
your faithless marriage to terrible tasks. No iris in the iron orbit of your skull, no hair, but that saved combed by ma- by, but that combed by magnets when you were molten red, just born, missionless without me. Future Man. Your weight greater than a stack of drawings, each page a frame of colonial fun. Stupid cloisonne helmet, white that could be chipped, stupid silver-blue suit that held the gleam of your mutant muscle. I cut you open with a hacksaw and found iron. Opened your absurd weight to vacuum, left you to die again and again and again. Transsuited for space, yet you sank even in tubs, refused rust, though stranded in sewers. The hard, minor bulk of you was my every hope. Why, if I am ugly, can I not alchemize to isotope? What? A red handkerchief, quartered with ball bearings, barely slows in your descent from my roof. Squat man, hero type, so weighty. What is it, deep in the heart of the sun, that wants you so near? What to expect? Gadget catalog. After the cashiering of amalgamite refineries, comfort is secured by fusion power spheres, for which there is no black market. The Joneses keep up with worldwide 3D news, sponsored by the ultimate road vehicle, the Astrovat 8000. We are linked via Visiphone. We adduce the aberrant via crime computer. We keep track of our cohort with the monitor board. Yet how often do fiends speak the words, prepare the ray cannon? Rip rays to shear through steel, anti-tron guns, retro rifles, and solar stunners, energo shields. War by other means is conducted on Weber's world, huge metal moon. We deposit telepathic plugs in your ear. We slide your transuit on one leg at a time. We will update our jetpacks to flight rings. We will upgrade our flight belts to flight rings in more economical means of flight, gleaming, heraldic, and characterized by ease of use. When misfortune befalls us, we give thanks for plasticasts and medikits, the satellite hospitals of Medicus I. If even greater misfortune befalls us, we give thanks for detention spheres and mento scanners. We are rewarded for our heroism with all forms of intergalactic species, including the metal-eating beasts of Rojan, none of which we need. As we set aside molecular glue guns, as we remove our anti-telepathy helmets, rest we in these battery beds. We visit the Cary Interplanetary Library and riffle through its dusty hollow tapes. We loiter in the Hall of Infinite Knowledge. We store abstract art, graven in light, in our tesseract closet. Even Computo, the conqueror, will suffer gradual domestication. Even Computo will bring us fruit juice and iced tea. And don't forget the miracle machine sitting in our basement. It turns thoughts into reality. We do not think about it. We were around about now in the 1970s. It was a very colorful time. (laughs) What to expect? Fashion forward. Oh, hell. In the spring of blooming youth and with the gift of magical fabrics, even that butterball bouncing boy looks good enough to eat. He fits in a slimming black and blue jumpsuit. Everything's gone around. Everything's come around. Thus, the 32nd iteration of the bouffant and the go-go boot, and therefore the cape of Princess Projectra of Arando, for its length and its suppleness and its adherence to her royal declivities and convexitudes. Likewise, the flared collar of her consort Val Armor and his pectoral muscles and his abdominal muscles and his navel, magnificent. For naught need protection nor support, and thus all indulge utter erotica. Witness Cosmic Boy, only gloved and bootied, Cosmic Boy now presenting maximum clavicle. Witness Tyrock, whose white onesie erupts into a butterfly collar, whose breast is barely contained by golden epaulets. <laughs> Taketh in thy waistcoat, 
tucketh in thy lace. This year's style is the style of every year previous, for the 30th century cannot tell history from utility from frivolity. Whither the zipper on this thing? Wherefore zipper when our suits are skin tight, seal smooth, cleaved to fit us at the apex of our fitness? Even modest light lass refuses to wear pants. Element lad has silver snaps up his back, back, back. When the lawsuit comes down for this book, I think that's probably going to be the primary poem of objection. <laughs> Let's see. This is roll call speed date. I was the head of my class. I was a world-class ball player. I got attacked by lightning beasts. Everyone's like this where I come from. Everyone's like this where I come from. No one's left where I come from. No one ever leaves where I come from. I just got lucky. I made a potion and drank it. My parents did this to me. Everyone's like this where I come from, but less so. I got locked in a lab by a mad scientist. Everyone's like this where I come from. Someone else made a potion and I drank it. I got swallowed by a space whale. Everyone's like this where I come from. Everyone was like this where I came from until a space pirate murdered them. I got attacked by lightning beasts, but then I met Dream Girl. Um, it's congenital? I taught myself. I'm enjoying my royal prerogative. I'm the last of my matriarchal line. I'm just special like that, I guess. My dad experimented on me. My body was destroyed, and this is what's left. I don't know, I just am. I'm the best. I'm the last. I'm the next. I'm pretty average, actually. I'm getting better and better. We've met before. <laughs> Brainiac 5 generates auto-critique. Every case I make is oblique. Dative. I take it. I do not get to the point. I do not see what it's for. <laughs> Grammar comedy. Data points are of three kinds, binary or yes-no, vector or array, and integer, which must perforce be real. Endless binaries branch into de facto chaos. I take wrong turns, but vector's even more hectic. With ballistics, I plot where you will be on the basis of where you are. Yet because you remain in motion, my equations never catch up. Integers, however, these are real when they are rational, real when they are irrational. I wish I couldn't say the same. Reckless, ragged, I throw myself against unrealizable goals with I think I can, and I think I can, and I think I can. Presence of clinical distance doesn't mean absence of clinical interest. Sometimes I go insane, and when I go, I sound just like I do before I left. But I don't know any other way to talk about it. I never met a problem I didn't think I could solve, which is the eruption of rationality into unreason. I thought I could save you from death even though you were dead before I was born. I found you even though you were never lost. How close could we ever get? Am I cold? Am I getting warmer? The closer you approach, the farther you recede. This was always the way it would be. That didn't stop me. Rational, unreasonable. I did this for you. I did this to myself. I went looking for you. I took you to heart. I do not understand what you do not understand is the perfect sentence, even though the perfect sentence is also the perfect sentence. The weight and motion of a thousand years must create detrition. This is why my manner is so flat. My mind worn smooth by friction. <laughs> Snow falls on alternate metropolis. <clears throat> this was the only opportunity we ever had uh, to re-encounter Pharaoh Lad. It's what an alternate universe is for. In this alternate universe, Pharaoh Lad is still alive. Unscheduled snow. Actual snow. The random weather that proves the inversion of the magic science ratio. In alternative metropolis, 
minor characters are major threats. Crude brutes have grown fey. The dead live again. Pharaoh lad would be returned to us, but we aren't ourselves. We're them. And when we are celebrated, and where we are celebrated, they are hounded underground. For us, he wore a mask of chrome, but for them, he dresses in rustic leather. Magic is more cruel than science, it seems, for it has driven even good witches to church and made men theologize what we knew as a matter of proof. Because he knows things shouldn't be this way, the boy who would have been Pharaoh lad helps cast a spell, ice reddened with blood sigils. He upturns the hourglass. The last thing he sees, ghostly, unfamiliar, us. Constellations pull themselves undone, and then the boy and the snow are gone. And I'll conclude with the pers persistence of espionage. Chameleon Boy rides the maglev to Montauk. Nobody on that train. It's Bear Tremble socialist. Synthetic slide down the future. It's dead white world's fair. Empty stations. Empty agents. No more buttons. No more coats. Reap Daggle dreams of Durla. His home. Her imagined ocean. Her drowned city, neither coral nor spire. Its epics are a collective colossus, generations beached and bleached, over 200 tons of elegant elbow sunk in diatomaceous sand, fallen body of friend and foe and family, right angle of the wrist risen to vertigo. In the last exploit of the espionage squad of the Legion of Superheroes, all the useless heroes will die, except Chameleon Boy, his knurled net polyform, and plasticine, eternal. But yes, phantom girl, shrinking violet, invisible kid. A lost city looms behind the wrecked and ruined dunes, 40,000 colors, 80,000 ages. The world is not like this at all. Thank you.